back. Um, hopefully you took care of what you needed to during that break. Um, I'm actually, you know, uh, things sometimes work out for the best. I'm actually excited that we're getting to have more time um, for uh, this conversation today for this panel. Um, I'm very excited about this panel. This panel has a lot of um, personal meaning for me and just I'm very excited to hear all of the different speakers um, in one conversation together. Um, so right now I'm going to hand it off to our uh, moderator for the night, um, who has also been so flexible with us. And I really just want to give you a great shout out. Um, we have Sharif Zafud from the Arab Resource Organizing Center in San Francisco, which is also where I call home. So all of this is full circle. Um, and he's going to be leading and moderating our panel. So Sharif, please, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum and hello, everybody. Welcome to day two of the third annual Palestinian American Community Center's virtual conference, Until Freedom, Reclamation, Resistance, and Resilience. Uh, my name is Sharif Zakut, uh, as was stated, and I'm an organizer with the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, also known as AROC. Uh, we are on Ohlone territory, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. AROC is a grassroots organization working to empower and organize our community toward justice and self-determination for all. We at AROC envision powerful and liberated Arab communities living with dignity from here to our homelands, and we see the liberation of Arab people inextricably tied to the liberation of all oppressed people. And so today, it's my pleasure to moderate tonight's conversation titled Solidarity Today, Freedom Tomorrow. As solidarity with Palestinian uh, struggle increases, how can communities who face interconnected struggles harness collective power for freedom for all oppressed peoples? Given that solidarity is nonlinear and always evolving practice, this session aims to explore the ways in which coalition building and solidarity networks either form or adapt during critical political moments. And so I'm very excited Joining us today is not one, but three panelists to help us unpack this point. So please show your love in the chats and please help me welcome Zeli Imani, Dr. Greg Burris, and Dr. Miriam Griffin. I will, be giving, um, I will be giving just a short introduction for each of our speakers. And then afterwards, we're gonna go ahead and get right into it. So our first speaker, Zeli Imani, is a community organizer and educator living in New Jersey. Zeli has served in diverse K through eight settings as an English slash math teacher and curriculum developer. Most importantly, Zeli has been organizing against anti-Black state violence with Black Lives Matter Patterson. He is also a co-founder of the Black Liberation Collective, a collective consisting of Black students who are dedicated to transforming institutions of higher education through unity, coalition building, direct action and political education that has initiated the hashtag student blackout movement uh, across campuses in the United States. Please give some love to Zeli. We also have with us Dr. Greg Burris, the Associate Professor of Media Studies at the American University of Beirut and the author of The Palestinian Idea, Film, Media and the Radical Imagination, Temple University Press 2019. And his work examines the intersections of race, culture and emancipatory politics, particularly with respect to Palestine. And he is currently working on a new book which explores Zionist and Palestinian modalities of time. So please give some love to Dr. Greg Burris. And then lastly, we have Dr. Miriam S. Griffin, Assistant Professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at University of Washington Bothell. Broadly, her work examines people's ordinary movements, both physical and political, and how they confront state powers in quotidian and spectacular ways. She is the author of Vehicles of Decolonization, Public Transit in the Palestinian West Bank, Temple University Press 2022, and the co-author of We Will Not Be Silenced, The Academic Repression of Israel's Critics, AK Press 2017. So for now, uh, I will go ahead and pass it to presenters. They will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we will have the remainder of our time for question and answer. Um, as well as moderating, I will be timekeeping, so I will hold up different uh, signs to indicate a two minute notice and a 30 second notice, and last card uh, requesting you to close at this point. And we know it can be difficult to be rigorous with our time, especially as we dive into these deep and juicy questions uh, but we really want to leave as much room as possible for our folks in the audience. So feel free to just type out your question throughout the session, and hopefully we'll get to them all at the end after they were received. 
So again, show some love to our panelists. Um, panelists, you have about 10 minutes to talk broadly about the work that you're involved in and what does solidarity mean to you. Uh, Zeli, I will pass it off to you to start us. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, first off, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, thank you so much to PAC for inviting me to um, today's event. I'm always thankful and happy to be in solidarity with um, PAC and y'all yeah, really are like my family. Um, I wish I had a, um, a doctorate degree like all my other co-panelists here. I feel a little, you know, shy about everything, but um, I'm really still excited about hopefully being able to share my words, um, share my beliefs and my thoughts on what solidarity looks like and what solidarity means to me as um, not only as an activist, but also just as a human being. So I think I wanna begin this talk by saying that we all like to think we practice solidarity to struggles both in and outside our communities. Many of us are surely outraged whenever we hear news or see footage of a black person experiencing anti-black state sanctioned violence from the police or civilian. Some of us help to organize rallies. Some of us even participate in some and others of us try to share things on our social media. But not all injustices experienced by oppressed communities go viral, but do not all oppressed people deserve justice? You shouldn't have to see pictures of crying Palestinian children to be convinced of their humanity. Oppression is present even when viral content isn't. If oppression is consistent, so too should our acts of solidarity. Solidarity should not be reserved for Instagram captions. As long as marginalized and oppressed communities are experiencing trauma and violence, and remain at risk to trauma and violence, so too should our commitment to them remain steadfast. Solidarity means informing yourself on the struggles of oppressed people and realizing that the absence of sensational headlines is not the absence of violence. The presence of settler colonialism is the presence of violence. The presence of settlers is the presence of violence. Too often we think that because we don't see a viral video of a, a black person being shot and killed by police, then everything is fine. Because we don't see um, a viral footage of um, a Palestinian's family home being taken away from them, we think that the crisis is now over, but that's not true. We shouldn't have to see a sensational headline or see a viral footage to be convinced that these injustices still remain and that these injustices are still worthy of fighting for because human beings are worthy of fighting for and Palestinians are humans. So when we think about settler colonialism, we have to remember that settler colonialism is a structure whereby the settler comes with the intention to permanently occupy the land to make the indigenous land their new home and source of capital. But the land is not empty when they arrive. The land is not without history when they arrive. So in order to build their lives and create their narratives, they have to destroy the homes and the narratives of the people who already live there. And that is what is happening in Palestine. The strategies are segregation, disenfranchisement, criminalization, demonization and erasure. As a black person living in America, living under global anti-blackness, I know segregation, I know criminalization, and I know erasure. My family knows segregation. My family knows oppression. My family knows living under the threat of violence from your oppressor and what it does to not just your generation, but the generations after you. For years, we as non-Palestinians have been told that the context and history of the illegal occupation of Palestine was complicated. It's not, it's not. It was just a tool to keep us ignorant and complicit 
of the violence of the people of Palestine. If as if Israel supporters don't want you to understand the occupation in order to prevent you from supporting Palestine. Zora Neale Hurston, a black female author said, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. If you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. Oppressors never see themselves as violent. The only violence they see is not of their own, but the resistance to their oppression. The settler is not innocent. His very existence is violence. Because his existence means the erasure and the disposal of indigenous people and indigenous communities. But if more Americans knew this analysis, their support or indifference towards Israel occupation would change. And that's something America does not want. Violence that Palestinians suffer then isn't a weekend of bombing, but the continued everyday violence of living under subjugation. Checkpoints are violence. Separate license plates for Palestinians and Israelis is violence. Restriction of movement is violence. The institutionalized segregation, disenfranchisement, and criminalization of Palestinians is why we label it an apartheid state. And as the apartheid state grows, the violence experienced by the colonized grows. So to end the violence is not a ceasefire, but the cease to the existence of the apartheid settler state of Israel. So solidarity isn't about ensuring the, com the comfortability of an oppressor and its allies. It's about ensuring the safety of the oppressed. Solidarity depends on a deep love for humanity and the humanity of the oppressed. That you are willing to risk your safety and your livelihood in order to protect someone else. It means challenging the dominant narratives of settler colonialism, even if it means facing backlash, because it also means that people can one day face liberation. You have to have that courage in order to face these dominant narratives, regardless of any harm or backlash that we may experience, because we know that the type of backlash that we may experience is not the same backlash that the Palestinians are going to experience, especially those that are living in Palestine. So it's up to us it's up to us to be able to fight for them and protect them. We are all right now sitting in our homes, sitting in our homes. But what about the Palestinians who are at risk of losing their homes? We have to fight to ensure that they can remain in their homes just as we are remaining in our homes tonight. So even if we have to call Israel an apartheid state, even if we have to use this language, which is accurate, in order for people to understand and be educated, we must do it. Even if it means facing backlash, even if it means, as for Black Lives Matter, being also being called a terrorist group. Because when we um, first did an uh, uh, issue, a support of Palestine, we was Black Lives Matter passing, who was the first chapter to um, issue a press release in support of the people of Palestine um, in 2020. And the news media quickly picked that up and was like, oh, look, the Black terrorists and you know the Palestinian terrorists are coming together. But no, the Black terrorists and the uh, Palestinian terrorists weren't coming together. The Black freedom fighters and the Palestinian freedom fighters, the Black humanists and the Palestinian humanists, these human beings were coming together because we both recognized what was happening was wrong and it needed to be called out and it needed to be challenged. And until those two things happening, nothing will ever change. So we must continue to educate ourselves, support and collaborate absent of moments and be courageous to challenge dominant narratives. Dr. King said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly 
affects all indirectly. No one is free until we are all free. Black Lives Matter, free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please show some love for Zeli Imani. And Zeli, there was something you said that I really appreciate and just want to uplift. It was the oppressor never sees themselves as violent. They only see the violence of resistance. And that I felt like was very powerful. And just thank you for sharing all of that and excited to get into this Q&A a little later. Um, I next up will go ahead and pass it off to Dr. Greg Burris. And as you may have noticed, my time cards are flipped on Zoom. So I'm gonna see if I could fix that. But otherwise, um, Dr. Greg, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you. All right, thank you for having me. Greetings everybody from Beirut. Um, it's 1.30 a.m. here. I'm not quite awake. Being part of this is an act of solidarity on my part. If, if it don't make complete sense, that could be a little bit of grace. I'm very happy to be here and very, very excited to be invited to talk about solidarity. I think what I want to do today is I, I kind of just want to give maybe a story of solidarity and then maybe have some reflections on that story. Uh, so many great, interesting people and encounters have happened as a result of solidarity and a lot of them get lost in history. And in my research on Black Palestinian solidarity, I came across a story that very few people seem to know about at all. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about this one particular biography that, sh that brings together how Black radicalism and Palestinian liberation can tangibly um, fit together and, and form each other. In 1963, a French Jew by the name of Alain Albert was born in secret in Nazi occupied France and under the Vichy regime. His parents were Jewish, and they were resistance fighters, so they had to actually have their children in secret, give them fake names, and uh, and, and hide from the Nazi regime. He grew up, um, you know, a Jew in anti-Semitic, very very anti-Semitic part of France. Um, he was a bit more dark, had a bit darker complexion than some of his classmates, and got made fun of. And uh, as a teenager, he started reading radical literature, people like Aimé Césaire, and became very um, politicized. Um, in the 1960s, this guy, Alain Albert, went to Paris and he became friends with the, the black scene. He became friends with the writer Chester Himes. He became friends with James Baldwin. When Malcolm X came through Paris on his way to Saudi Arabia, he met him. Um, he played jazz inside of a black, uh, a black jazz band and he became friends with Richard Wright, Richard Wright, the author of uh, Native Son, his widow, Ellen Wright. Ellen Wright put him in contact with some publishers in the United States, and he wrote a book, which you can find, called The Crossing. He wrote it in English, even though he had never been to the United States. And it, the, it's a protagonist is a black outlaw on the run in Jim Crow, United, in Jim Crow America. Well, after having you know, immersed himself in black culture, in jazz, in the writings of James Baldwin and Chester Himes, he met up with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and convinced Sartre to buy him a plane ticket to go to Africa to start looking at the anti-colonialist movements there. He started in Angola, worked his way up to Ivory Coast, Mali, and eventually Algeria. And while he's in Algeria, he decided to start learning Arabic. And there he met Syrians and Palestinians who started to talk to him about the Palestinian struggle. Now, as a Jew, he was interested in learning more. So he actually moved to Israel. He did take citizenship. He became an Israeli. Um, and he took the, Hebrew, the Hebrewized name Ilan Halevi. Now, he was a left-wing Israeli. He was part of an anti-Zionist group. But after about 10 or 15 years, once the 70s came along, he decided it wasn't good enough. So this Jew born in Nazi-occupied Palestine, uh, France, who became friends with James Baldwin and met Malcolm X, joined the PLO, and he rose in the ranks of the PLO. He became one of Yasser Arafat's advisors. He was even one of the delegates to the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991. Um, the Israelis at this conference refused to talk to him because they saw him as a turncoat. They saw him as a traitor to the Jewish nation. And so some of the other Palestinian delegates made fun of the, their Israeli peers and said, what's wrong with you? Are you anti-Semites? Why won't you talk to our Jew? Why won't you talk to our Jewish comrade? So, you know, he lived in Beirut for a while. Uh, he, he worked with uh, the PA, um, even though we might have disagreements with the PA and, and Arafat. Uh, I think this biography is a very interesting example of solidarity of somebody who was born into a completely different world 
And his path to Palestinian radicalism was literally forged through black culture and black radicalism. It's a very interesting biography. When I look at this biography, I wonder what is it that drove him? What drove him to perform solidarity, to enact solidarity, and to live solidarity with these different peoples? And the one thing that he did, I, I definitely don't think he was motivated by, was he wasn't feeling sorry for them. He didn't join the Palestinians because he felt sorry for them. He didn't he didn't fall in love with the fiction of Baldwin because he felt sorry for him. He sensed something there that he was compelled to join, to imitate, to learn from, right? And this is, I think, one of the problems we have in solidarity today. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but every time I turn on Instagram or Facebook or anything, I see solidarity. I see memes, I see pictures, I see texts. And that's good. It makes me excited that I see Palestine so much in my own personal news feeds. But some of it, some of it kind of leaves me a little bit wanting for something more. And I've been trying to figure out what it is. What is it that bothers me about some forms of solidarity that I see today? And I realize a lot of it, I think, is kind of based on charity. Now, I'm not against charity. When somebody needs help, we have to give them charity. I'm not completely dismissing it. But let's think about this for a second. If you are helping the Palestinians only in these particular times, particular times of, let's say, Israel decides to mow the grass using Israeli lingo and bomb Gaza again, or you know, some sort of particular emergency, if that is the cause of the solidarity and it's all about charity, let's help the Palestinians because they are victims, that has, that has limits. Viewing the Palestinians as victims and, and performing solidarity in those terms only goes so far. You know, this, there's a problem here, I think, with the way we conceive of Palestine. If you go to the library and look at books on Palestine, and look at the covers of the book, look at the pictures on the books, you'll see, you'll see walls, you'll see bombs, you'll see checkpoints, you'll see uh, barbed wire fences. That's not Palestine, that's Israel. All right, this is Israel studies. The bombs that fall, the checkpoints, the apartheid walls, that's Israel. Palestine should never be seen as synonymous with Israel's victories. Palestine is not that story. Palestine is a story of liberation. Palestine is a story of freedom. It far exceeds Israel's worst, you know, technologies of oppression. And I think it's our duty to organize our, solid our solidarity around that liberation. Palestine is not just, a, our solidarity shouldn't be organized around Israel's victories. It should be organized around Palestine, the, the way that freedom is enacted day to day in Palestine. It's a very compelling story. It's a beautiful story. It's one that I truly believe will outlive Israel. Um, Palestine is alive. And even this kind of ironically, the name of this panel is Solidarity Today, Freedom Tomorrow. In a certain sense, freedom is also today. It's being enacted now by Palestine already in the here and now. Um, so what does that do? If, if we organize our solidarity not around charity, but around liberation, it's also far reaching. We're not doing it just to help Palestinians. In a way, we're doing it because the Palestinians are helping us no matter who we are and where we are. Um, it doesn't matter where you are in this world. If you focus on liberation, it has, it has consequences and relevancy, not only for people living underneath Israeli apartheid, but for people living under any government in any situation, whether it's under white supremacy or, or anything at all. With the lessons that we can learn from, Palestin from Palestinian liberation apply to us no matter where we are in this world of various forms of oppression. So to return to Alan Halevi and thinking about social media, thinking about solidarity. Um, I'm only gonna go for another minute, it's fine. I think, I think Halevi shows a true curiosity and openness towards the other, a passion for liberation. And I think that potentially we are all Ilan Halevi. We are all people who can learn from liberation movements from here and there and that, let that inform our struggle. I think it's a much better way than just using, you know, seeing the Palestinians as victims. So those are some of my comments. Um, if nothing else, I hope the story of Alan Halevi is a new one that people can look into. So thank you all for having me and I look forward to the conversation. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Burris. Please show some love to Dr. Burris in the chat. 
And I just want again want to appreciate joining us, especially with this time difference, sharing that piece of history and also the limits of solidarity if it's grounded around victimhood and charity and the importance of what solidarity actually means. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to our next speaker. Uh, last but certainly, certainly not least, we have Dr. Miriam S. Griffin um, and I will pass it off to you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, so I am very much not as well spoken as either Zelly or Greg. Um, and so I hope you'll just bear with me. That's just, I'm naturally that way. I don't really have a, an excuse of, of time or anything like that. Um, but I am going to just offer a, a brief, maybe um, comment or reflection um, uh, building off of what Zelly and Greg have already offered us. Um, and it is coming from um, my uh, very uh, specific position as um, a, a sociological researcher who did research in Palestine, also as an Arab American, my mom is Lebanese um, and my family has had a very long and um, interesting and important history with Palestine. Um, and so, all of these things came together to lead me to the academic work um, that I do, which I also consider to be you know, political work. Um, and so uh, basically the, the point that I'd like to draw out for this session um, is really just about the way that solidarity, of course, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear my baby screaming by me. <laughs> So sorry. Okay, I can hear him screaming. Um, uh, he's being cared for by his other parent. Um, so uh, uh, the thing that I wanted to draw out about the practice of solidarity to me is that it also involves a kind of stance or a way of seeing. Um, and so I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about what that kind of stance or way of seeing has meant for me. Um, which is that it has involved a kind of uneasy evolving process of both trying to develop a razor sharp, precise diagnosis of oppression, um, which pulls no punches and is brutally um, reflective and accurate of all of the kinds of violences, particularly that Zelie was outlining for us um, that often go ignored, um, if not uh, outright, um, euphemize, is that a word? Like, <laughs> as you were saying, Zell, you know, that get represented not only as uh, not violence, but actually as the opposite of violence, right? Um, and so I think that that's a very important part of the stance of solidarity. But I also think that the other important part is honing a very honest and observant and sensitive way of um, recognizing the way that people are living in excess of that violence. Um, and I think, you know, this is what Greg was talking about um, when, you know, he, he talked about freedom is now and the way that um, Palestinians are enacting this freedom. Um, for me, that really meant, you know, paying attention to uh, the very small details of everyday life that add up to um, really a kind of meaningful uh, decolonization. And so here, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the way that people's everyday actions um, uh, enact uh, what Edward Said uses one word in a, a string of <laughs> words to describe decolonization. And that one word that has really resonated with me is to re-inhabit the land, right? So how are Palestinians working and acting um, and doing things and living their lives in ways that meaningfully re-inhabit land that has been stolen from them. Um, and, uh, and so that is um, the important, uh, I would say the other important component of um, the, the stance of solidarity is to, is to be attuned to those things. Now that is all like well and good, but I think that those uh, of us who are engaged constantly in trying to figure out what it means to practice solidarity. Um, if you share my uh, thoughts about bringing both of these uh, two perspectives together, um, 
we'll often find that there's a, a lot of emphasis on Palestinian suffering. And there's a, an expectation of the overrepresentation of Palestinian suffering. And I think this is a completely understandable um, expectation given decades and decades of um, very concerted effort to hide Palestinian suffering and to uh, spin Palestinian suffering and to, um, you know, uh, get, uh, you know, again, going back to what Zelie said, get sympathy for those who are uh, generating the conditions of Palestinian suffering. Um, and yet, I think that this is where the difficult work of solidarity, one of the places where the difficult work of solidarity comes in, because um, while, of course, I think it's important to respond to expectations to um, you know, deliver messages about Palestinian suffering. I also think that we have um, the responsibility to represent the way that Palestinians are more than just victims. Um, and so I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm coming here um, with uh, lots of humility. I'm not uh, suggesting that I have the answers. I'm I'm coming, uh, I'm bringing these thoughts that I derive from reading at the intersection of like indigenous studies and Palestine studies. And so it's not um, like my ideas or anything like that. Um, but I, I just thought I would uh, put that uh, forward and, and, and put that really to the audience because I think that we all have um, in different spaces, you know, way beyond academia and different spaces have come up against that expectation to really represent Palestinian suffering. And so I wanted uh, us to also think about how we represent, you know, active modes of Palestinian decolonization. Um, and the last, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll end with just a pitch <laughs> um, uh, to, you know, take up this um, provocation. Um, I think that it's important to remember that oppressive systems uh, tend to generate mythologies about their own um, imperviousness. And so uh, one of the things that like protects uh, oppressive systems, oppressive regimes is this like reputation of being undefeatable. And so if we constantly play into that, even even with the best of intentions, you know, you want to highlight Palestinian suffering because what you're trying to do is you're trying to stop that suffering. The, there's this unintended consequence of continuing to build up this image of Israeli settler colonialism as inevitable and relentless and, um, you know, permanent. And I mean, Israel wants that to be true. <laughs> for sure wants all of those things to be true, but it's not true. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to figure out ways of uh, walking this very fine line between those two, um, uh, you know, important tasks. Okay, thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dr. Griffin and uplifting the difficult work of solidarity and our responsibility and how we bring these stories to build together in our movements. Um, awesome, please show some love to Dr. Griffin in the chat. Um, we are now gonna go ahead and kind of move into the meat of our discussion. And we really do wanna encourage this to kind of just be a discussion. So I'll ask questions, um, I'll have some questions for y'all as the moderator, but we also wanna encourage folks who are with us here today to please post some questions in the chat um, and we'll go ahead and bring as many of them, of them as we could. And so I wanted to just start off and, and uh, Dr. Griffin, you were, as you were talking, I was starting to think of this question and uh, just really what is the role of academia in our larger movement work? If, if folks wanna start with that um, and then we can kind of move on to our next question. Who would like to start us off? I can start, but I'm like quickly trying to Google this quotation that I want to read and it's not going to happen. So <laughs> I'll just um, not say the quotation. Um, uh, first of all, Mediam is fine or Mariam for the non uh, speakers of Arabic. Um, I don't need to, Dr. Griffin is not <laughs> necessary. Um, uh, you know, this is uh, funny. I am 
a little bit, Sharif, curious like about the source of this question because it's a question that seems to um, reflect like a lot of anxieties that emerge in academic spaces that I don't think are necessarily shared beyond academic spaces. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that is just like, I, I have a curiosity about uh, how that question really comes up. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of like responsibilities for uh, people who are in academia, I think that, um, it's important for those of us who have certain kinds of tools, right, who, who get trained in particular ways to bring those tools to contribute to um, the kind of, you know, movements that we believe in. And so that doesn't always mean um, just, it, it can, but it doesn't always mean just producing um, a directly uh, useful or deployable academic reports that like, you know, expose a certain topic or, or go and gather certain data um, that can be used by more useful people. I think the, th the thinking sometimes goes. That definitely can be something that academics do. Um, but I, I think that, that that allows academics to also back away from some of our own responsibilities as thinking people with consciences um, to uh, really stand uh, politically in solidarity with uh, the movements and commitments that we espouse, um, which means also like generating our own ideas um, that we hope uh, help to advance those um, movements. And so I think that that can, can be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes um, uh, for academics because uh, there's an expectation that we uh, take a step back or we allow, you know, the activists to, you know, take the, the reins. And, um, you know, there are certain spaces where that's completely appropriate, but I think at the, at the level of sort of um, envisioning and uh, sort of like bringing the world that we want to see into being, that really is gonna require much more um, exchange of ideas, like, you know, uh, on, on a sort of equal footing. Um, Awesome, thank you, Miriam. And and just to name, I um, so you know my family is from Gaza, and I also had the privilege of going to uh, through the master's program at San Francisco State uh, for ethnic studies. So questions around methodologies and what does it mean to both be an organizer but also be able to have a college education. As you were talking about the importance of how we bring stories, that was kind of why I asked that question. So. Um, thank you for answering that. I'm not sure if anyone else would like to also respond to this question. What is the role of academia in movement work? I mean, I, I will just say very briefly that I think one of our one of our duties, not just academics, but anybody, any thinking people, I think one of our duties is to show that the reality of oppression is not the only reality at all. Like, uh, you know, the hegemonic way that we look at the world and who is powerful and who is permanent is not at all to the truth. There are counter realities. There's freedom underneath the unfreedom that's all around us. Um, you know, my, my fellow panelist, Miriam Griffin, just her book that you mentioned, think about the name of her book, Vehicles of Decolonization. She could have written a book called Roads of Oppression or, uh, you know, she could have written a book called uh, Highways of Colonization, and they would have been accurate. But instead of just describing Israel's power, she's showing the cracks in that power. She's showing the ways that Israel does not succeed in completely obliterating Palestinians, and that the vehicles are actually taking part in decolonization. Sorry, I just described your book for you, but I think this is an, this is an, I, I think this is an example of us showing that the reality of oppression is not the only reality. I'm quite partial to Tunnels of Rebellion, if you want a next title, but uh, <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Um, cool, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next question. And the next question I have for you all is like, at this moment, we're, we're seeing a very clear and intentional push for support and solidarity with the people of Ukraine. And with this, we've seen what local and state decision makers, industries, and even corporations are capable of when there is enough political will. And we're also seeing terminology that we've used 
in BDS for years now being normalized and, and used in this particular context. So my question is, what is our role in exposing these double standards and how can this sudden shift for Ukrainian solidarity also uplift our collective solidarity with Palestine, with Yemen, Tigray, Haiti, Black America, and other struggles that have been overlooked for years. And I'll just open it up. It's a lot, that's a lot to unpack right there. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to tackle this. Um, yeah, so that's definitely a lot to unpack. I think that as many of us who are, uh, who identify as people of color, this is not something new we've experienced, um, especially in regards to social media. Um, every time there is a tragedy in a um, European nation, it's always like, we are France, right? We are, you know, England, we are this place, but we are never, you know, Palestine, we're never Lebanon, we are never, you know, Nigeria, we are never, you know, South Africa, we are never other places. And this goes down to um, this dehumanization, oftentimes of um, people of color, that because people don't recognize the black people as human beings, we are never them. We are not them because we don't see ourselves in them. We are not Palestinian because we don't recognize Palestinians as human beings and as human beings uh, deserving of equal rights. So I'm not really surprised at this, but I'm glad that so many people are able to point this distinction that's occurring on social media out. And I think that's a very important part that's been happening within the past few years, specifically with the massive amount of support that um, of solidarity that um, the Palestinian movement has been getting for the past two years, the shift that has occurring, where before people would say this is violence going on both sides, and now you see a shift of people saying that there's not violence on both sides, that there isn't both sides. Like these types of um, distinctions wasn't, wasn't a large part of the discourse before, but now it's certainly becoming more, more important and more popular for people to acknowledge and not only just acknowledge, but challenge it. So I'm thankful that people are able to point that out and go into deeper discussions about why this is happening. Because I think it's, that's, that's the key part, right? Not just being able to see what's happening, but to understand why this is happening. And as a part of this dehumanization, the continued dehumanization of um, Palestinian people, and we cannot allow that to happen, right? Because even with the tragedies that's happening in Ukraine, right? When they say like, we are all Ukrainian right now, but what about the African refugees that's in Ukraine? They're, they're not Ukraine, right? They're not Ukrainian because you're not giving them um, the resources, the care and the support that they need. But again, it's the dehumanization of Africans, the dehumanization of Black people. And this de continued dehumanization of you know, Palestinians and Black people and other people that we have to be able to challenge and be able to recognize. Yeah, thank you, Zali. And I agree with you completely as far as like, I, you know, it's also not surprising in many ways. And my family, so my mom uh, was from Safad and actually her family grew up in Syria. And so funny enough, I, I recently had a conversation with a Lyft driver who was like, oh, I'm from Poland and we have like great immigration. We're bringing in all the Ukrainian refugees. So of course, like I had to bring up, well, like what happened around Syria? And we see them flat out saying like, they're different people, they're different color, they're different religion, they're different whatever, while also simultaneously going back to this point of like oppressors never see themselves as violent, being like, we're not racist, but y'all are different. And we're afraid of that, where it's like, that is clearly racism. And so I, I appreciate you naming that. I don't know if anyone else would like to jump in. Yeah, Miriam. I, I talked for a and Greg, if you wanna go, I can. <laughs> Go no worries, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to, um, uh, yeah, just uh, jump in and add, you know, I, I think uh, I've seen a lot of people experiencing, um, you know, the, the kind of, yeah, just like disconnect that you both are, are describing, Zelle and Sharif, about like, <laughs> okay, where was all of this solidarity like five seconds ago? Um, and I, I think that, 
uh, so Neda Ilya talked about like her feelings of uh, bitterness, uh, you know, looking at, it, at all of this um, outpouring of solidarity. And I think this is really uh, connected to a very long um, history of the way that human rights have circulated around the world since their inception. And the, I think the danger here is, is um, that there, this is an, just another expression of a long struggle um, where the West is constantly trying to both claim um, ownership over human rights and also uh, do everything that it can to actively deny human rights to those um, whose uh, self-determination they are, <laughs> uh, they find inconvenient. Um, and so I, I, I think that the, so the, the legacy of this uh, hypocrisy of the West on human rights is a um, is the fact that the entire world now has inherited a basically unenforceable body of human rights, and that is because like the U.S. and uh, <laughs> England went out and like tried everything they could to actually destroy the mechanisms of enforcing human rights in order to protect their own um, colonial policies and their own apartheid policies. Um, I'm going off like this, like a, a baddie professor, because what I'm trying to highlight is that these hypocrisies are not just about who's going to post a a frame on their Facebook profile at one time and not at another time and the way that that makes us feel, but the fact that it has these really material consequences that then take human rights out of reach for everybody. Now nobody gets to have human rights because we don't really have enforceable human rights. And I'm being really like dismissive. I have a much more complicated like opinion about human rights, but the, the, I'm just trying to illuminate the stakes of when we highlight these hypocrisies. It's not just about, oh, these people are racist and they don't really see the fact that people of color and people of the third world are human. Yes, that is the fundamental problem, but the consequences are that we then can't have nice things. <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, Greg. Why don't you just jump in? I mean, all I could add to what my other panelists have already said is just that, um, you know, this is such an old story. I mentioned in my my talk, the book that was very influential to Ilan Halevi, I, My Cesare's Discourse on Colonialism. He has a long section where he talks about why you guys, all, you, all, you all talk about the Holocaust and Hitler, but I come from the third world and all of our experience with the Western world has been one Holocaust on top of another. And so, I mean, this this type of hypocrisy is it's such an old story. In fact, I almost get sick of talking about it because it just happens. It's like everybody, it almost seems like people are surprised it keeps happening when that's just, that's the status quo. That's how it works. Um, so I, I, I'm almost, I'm almost tired of the surprise. <laughs> I'm definitely tired of the surprise. Um... I have something in the chat. It's not a question kind of question, but it's um, how are we thinking about what solidarity means when being willing to lose something, cash out, priv uh, cash out privilege, skin in the game, like when Bettina Love talks about the white dude who held the flagpole while Bree Newsom took down the Confederate flag so cops wouldn't tase, uh, tase the pole. Um, and so I think what, and, and feel free to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but I think what this is referring to is like, when is it that we call on specific allies for specific mobilizations or like, when is it appropriate to kind of like, um, like what, what is, what is inappropriate when showing solidarity when you're like, you know, I know sometimes when we do direct action, folks are like, well, this is a high risk action. So maybe we need other folks in the front to be able to like support us with this. Well, at the same time, we're not trying to you know, um, like make sure the optics are also enforcing what our, our demands are and what we're actually there for. And so it's always kind of this balance of like, when is it right to use other communities? And, and maybe that's not a good way of saying it, use other communities, but when is it appropriate to kind of like mobilize other communities in allyship and solidarity? And what does that look like?
I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I have much to say on this, but nobody's saying anything. I mean, yeah, it, you know, these kinds of questions are very difficult to answer because it, everything is, it's always such a case by case basis. Who is there? What is going on? What is a particular situation? Um, and, and in fact, that's why even talk, discussions of strategy become very difficult because what works at one situation will certainly not work at another situation. You know, it, so, I mean, thinking through all these power dynamics and privileges and identities with respect to, to solidarity work is absolutely crucial and critical and ongoing and never ending. But at the minute you put your name to something and say, this is the way it should work, things change. Identities shift, power dynamics shift. And in the next situation, it might be the exact opposite. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I personally would agree with you. I mean, our conditions shift all the time and what may also have worked for us may not necessarily work the next day or, or you know, the next year or whatever. And so definitely the importance of what does it mean when we're in solidarity with, uh, with each other? How do we build, you know, shared strategy and recognize when tactics do work for each other and when, when they don't work for us? And, and what does it look like to continuously assess that? Um, so my next question, and this is another question from me, is, um, you know, with in line with war and occupation, it's becoming frighteningly clear that people have no intention of stopping oil and gas extraction. I'm, I'm going a little bit of a different direction here. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of our communities facing the brunt of these man-made global disasters uh, to what Zeli was talking about earlier with indigenous folks that, uh, you know, like we are seeing also water protectors being hit with felonies and even begin to normalize things like fire season here in California or even like a pandemic uh, that's gone global. And so with all of that, we're actually seeing our decision makers rely more heavily on greenwashing technologies like those from Israel and more military spending to solve our climate disasters. So my question is, as people who are dedicated to the dignity and livelihoods of our people globally, what is our role in integrating our activism and organizing into environmental justice work? And the reason I ask that is because I do feel like it's just so timely and so necessary within our moment to think about like, what is the current work we're doing in relation to like literally a dying world at this moment? Not to sound super like, uh, like oh my gosh, but it, it's a very serious issue. And so I definitely just wanted to uplift that in this conversation, we're talking about solidarity. And for many of us literally being on stolen land, talking about Palestine as a stolen land. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and open it up. Miriam, do you have something to say? Sure. Um, so, uh... You know, this is a, a really pressing question, I think, for everybody in every movement. <laughs> um, and so uh, I think that it, in, in the context of what we're talking about today, um, a very precise critique of uh, the way that, you know, settler colonialism and global uh, apartheid have um, really alienated people from uh, the ways, uh, their ways of living that um, have been proven over centuries to be more sustainable than what is uh, uh, what what is required to fuel settler colonialism and apartheid. Um, I think is an important part of the diagnosis, right? So that is one thing that has been dispossessed: is certain ways of living and being. Um, but you know, living on land and also living in community in relation to land. Um, and so, you know, to me, part of uh, integrating our work um, with uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, I guess, impulses toward environmental justice is to be sensitive to all of these ways of living that have uh, been, um, part of the dispossession um, and and to then you know go back going back to my opening remarks uh, also highlight the way that people are um, you know reclaiming those ways of, of living and, and actively trying to uh, you know even innovate on them and, and generate new ways of doing that so I mean 
the West Bank is like very fertile ground for really creative ways that people are like using trash to, you know, create um, like pieces of art and, 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 and functional items. Um, people are, are uh, really invested in um, their our, uh, uh, initiatives to, uh, what's the word? to like uh, figure out how to irrigate uh, plants with like uh, little and uh, recycled water. Sorry, this is obviously not my area, but just, you know, a casual observation. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that it is uh, paying attention to the way that also people are trying to like reacquaint themselves and reclaim those um, practices that are, are more sustainable than uh, the uh, an annihilating, <laughs> Uh, mechanisms of settler colonialism, I think, is a, a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Showing our resiliency, especially in these moments, very important. Um, Zeli, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great question. And oftentimes that um, people disconnect these struggles between each other, right? So when we think about black liberation or, you know, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, oftentimes people reduce it to just a movement against police brutality, but it's not a movement about against police brutality. It's not just a movement about fighting for those whose lives were taken by police officers. It's also about fighting for the people who are still here. It's fighting for the black people who are still living in this world. So when you think about that, in order for us to be able to live our few full lives as human beings here in this world, we have to end these systems of oppressions and these systems of domination. Not just these systems that are dominating man for man, but also that's dominating animals and also dominating the land as well. And these are the things, these are the structures that we have to always focus on to be able to dismantle. And that's why solidarity is so important because solidarity depends on us recognizing the humanity of each other. If I'm able to recognize the humanity of a Palestinian or someone from Lebanon, I'm able to recognize that what is dominating them is also dominating me. That the oil spills that's happening in the Niger Delta region, even though it's in the Niger Delta region, it's still gonna affect me. It's still affecting me as a human being. It's gonna affect the planet and it's also going to affect the animals living on this planet. And if I'm concerned about humanity, if I'm concerned about the planet, and my off, and my concern about animals, then I have to be concerned about what's going on with the Niger Delta. I have to be concerned about what's going on in Palestine. It's not separate. That we can't reduce, you know, the violence in Palestine still to, you know, bombings. We have to also recognize, you know, about the lack of water. We have to recognize the lack of resources that Palestinians are experiencing. We have to recognize that with global warming that's happening, how is that affecting the land that the Palestinians are actually fighting for? What is the point of fighting for land that's going to be not fertile, you know, 30 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now? So in order to protect that land, not just now, but in the future, we have to be mindful of the climate change, and we have to be mindful of the fight for um, liberation against these structures that are trying to extract oil, extract resources from our community for profit. And we have to recognize the system that is putting profit before people. And if we want people to be put first, we have to dismantle these systems. And I think these are the conversations that people are starting to have, that in order to have real peace, Real peace doesn't mean just the absence of bombings, but real peace also means the extraction of resources for the betterment of someone else and not for the betterment of all. Thank you so much. Greg. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I said in my comments is that um, it's amazing how, um, you know, whenever we partake in solidarity with the movement, how it transforms other things that we weren't necessarily expecting it to transform. I mean, we saw that, actually Zelly mentioned it already actually with Black Lives Matter and, and some of the discussion about Palestine there and, and how it was used within Black Lives Matter. You saw in the 60s when there was the, you know, there's a great debates around SNCC and other groups about, you know, those who, 
who use the Palestinian movement and other anti-colonial movements to deepen their critique of U.S. empire. But this also works with environmentalism. You know, an so some sort of a green environmental activism that's not connected to these power struggles becomes a very, very milk toast, liberal, everybody needs to change their light bulb and just hope for the best kind of kind of movement, which really does nothing except makes people who can afford the expensive light bulbs feel good about themselves. So whenever you, whenever you, uh, obviously something like Palestine needs environmentalism because they're talking about a land that's being ruined by the Israelis. But the opposite's also true. If the green movement's going to have any teeth, it needs to take into account such things as Palestine and the paradynamics of colonialism. Thank you for sharing that, yes. I think that there is a problem right now with kind of this more democratic framing of like, we should do our individual part when not necessarily looking at the infrastructures or larger institutions that are actually contributing to the death of our planet, especially namely, you know, war making industries and the same people who are literally enforcing occupation on our lands. And so um, just appreciate folks saying that and, and also want to emphasize, you know, any, any real environmental justice movement does necessitate a strong anti-war analysis, strong anti-occupation, anti-colonialist analysis. Um, so thank you all for participating in that question and for letting me ask that. I have one more question from the chat and I believe this will be the last question of today's Q&A. The last question is, what has been your favorite moment of solidarity that you've been in or witnessed and what made it powerful? And let's just go ahead and start at the order we had speakers. So Zeli, I will go ahead and start with you. Oh man, um, I want to say, um, wow, I, when Patterson had that massive rally um, on, was it Gold Ave? And um, that to me was one of the most powerful moments that um, we, I was able to witness and experience because in that moment, right, it wasn't just um, Palestinian faces there. It wasn't just Muslim faces. It was a sea of diversity of people who was there in order to um, support um, the Palestinian movement for liberation and really support the Palestinian movement for liberation. That people were unap unapologetically saying there isn't no both sides, that Israel is an apartheid state, right? And that when politicians went up there and said that, you know, violence needs to end on both sides. People just wasn't quiet and just let them speak. People booed, you know, like people booed popular politicians, like pretty much like off the stage. And that to me was like, wow, here's the shift happening where people are no longer allowing politicians to tell them how to fight or how to feel that this was a shift happening. And I felt that love and I felt that energy and always going back to solidarity, that solidarity I always believe is always rooted in love. And we was all loving each other in that moment and loving the Palestinians in their homeland and say like, no, you're not gonna disrespect um, Palestinians. You're not gonna disrespect their fight. And we stood up against really powerful politicians unapologetically without a, like a, a flip. That's um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Greg, go right for it. You know, I've, I've been I've been I've been in Lebanon for the last seven years, and uh, it's I've seen I've seen a lot since I've come here. I think I've gotten a complete education. I've become an adult here. Um, in 2020, 2019 and 2020, we had a massive protest movement. And Lebanon's a country of maybe six, seven million people. And at one point, there was close to three million people in the streets on the same day. I mean, it's, it's, that still blows my mind that 50 percent of the country that day was in the streets. It's easy to say it went nowhere. The catastrophe only got worse. The economy completely collapsed. When I go home tonight, I have no electricity because we only get two electric hours of electricity a day in Lebanon these days. Um, and so it's easy to like lose hope that all of those protests were for nothing. But I persist in believing something changed in terms of people's consciousness. And it might take a decade, a century, before it purples back up again, and some of these memories that were forged on the streets will, you know, energize people again. 
Um, but it, it was a beautiful thing to behold. Uh, you know, there are many moments that brought tears to your eyes. They're so beautiful. There are many moments that made you just laugh. Um, one of the things I really liked, one particular moment was a group of film enthusiasts decided to do down in occupied downtown Beirut. They decided to make their own film program and show films. They brought a projector and they passed out popcorn and have like their own film um, film screening. And some of the films were silly. I think they showed a couple of like Marvel films. Some of them are very political. But one film they decided to show, I thought was so ingenious. It's a 1969 film by the Senegalese director, Osman Sembene, known as the father of African cinema. The name of the film is Black Girl. It's about a, a woman from Senegal who goes to France to be a nanny. And she gets there and realizes she's just the modern version of a slave. It's a very sad film. But they selected that film in particular because that is one of the massive problems of Lebanon. The entire system of imported domestic servants, usually from Ethiopia or Eritrea, and the way they're treated and, and, and the, 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 the terrible stories of racism that they, are, they experience. Um, the, the protesters saw this major protest as, a move, as an opportunity to show solidarity with those in Lebanon who never, never get represented and shown solidarity for. So in the middle of this protest movement, Black Girl was shown on the walls. I thought it was a beautiful moment. Super powerful, yeah. Um, thanks both for sharing those. Uh, lots of things came to mind, but maybe one is um, um, when at the uh, Standing Rock uh, protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, you know, seeing the the image of um, Skybird Black Owl giving birth or having just given birth, holding her baby, um, and just having a kafia draped around her neck, um, and and she's articulating. Um, you know, the, the fact that her giving birth is an act of uh, resistance to ongoing settler colonialism um, and, and, and wearing this kafia in the moment, um, just registering so much resonance there, um, you know, around settler anxieties about, um, you know, the demographic threat of indigenous populations and, um, and the, this kind of just like, uh, you know, irrepressible uh, presence um, and on ongoing uh, survivance, I think is, is maybe, you know, just a, one of the, the favorite images that comes to mind. And thanks, that was an awesome question too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate everything you had to share and especially thank you for sharing your most powerful solidarity moment. I wanna encourage everyone to uh, say thank you to our panelists, shower them with love, share your emojis, all of that. Um, and I also wanna affirm that whoever you are, as we're closing out this you know, solidarity, solidarity today, freedom um, tomorrow, that everyone has a place in our movement and everyone has a place in fighting for each other's dignity and liberation. And just um, want to again, thank you three, Zeli, Greg, and Miriam for joining us today. Um, I wanna close out by thanking Sunnyside Title for being a sponsor of our conference. Reach out to Chris Khalaf for any of your residential or commercial title insurance and settlement needs at chalaf, C-K-H-A-L-A-F at sunnysidetitle.com. And then lastly, we have a fun trivia question for you all. And the first person to answer correctly will get a free conference t-shirt. So fill out the form in the chat for the fill out the form in the chat for your chance to win um to win the shirt and thank you all so much again for joining us tonight it's been an amazing conversation thank you so much for having me as moderator and um wishing everyone a fantastic weekend thank you so much thank you thank you Shadi, for doing such a great job moderating and being so flexible with all my voice notes in the last two hours and i just i also want to personally thank all three of you Mariam, i haven't got a chance to meet you i've met zeli and greg but like i want to get to know you so much more after this and solidarity is a lot of my work so i'm definitely thank you greg for connecting us and we're definitely gonna hopefully all stay in touch sure. thank you greg for doing this so late too i really appreciate it it's okay thank you everybody thanks everyone have a good night Good night.